classical conditioning. So again, um, <clears throat> the key here is associating. You anticipate, actually, uh, it's associating. So you anticipate something's going to happen. I hear a noise. Oh, here comes something, whatever's been conditioned. Uh, I smell something. I, I see something. Uh, you anticipate what's coming next. That's classical conditioning. Uh, anticipating uh, based on two different um, uh, events or occurrences. What separates that and distinguishes it from the next one, which is also still behaviorism, uh, it has to do with uh, external stimuli, shaping you as a person. Uh, it's called operant conditioning. The difference here is you don't associate things necessarily. So for classical conditioning, my association means if I hear or see something, I always assume something's going to follow up with it. Okay. Uh, again, if I smell the food, I, I assume I'm going to be eating, and I, and I salivate. Um, or you know, I teach a dog to learn that if I hear the bell, here comes food, then he salivates. Uh, so I always think, here's this, next comes this. Opera conditioning is different. This is going to be, how can I phrase this? I don't want to use the book definition because it's not a very good one. Um, this is stimuli that affects or impacts behavior and probability. So here's what I mean by that. You don't anticipate necessarily, but these are things you would use to encourage people to do something you want them to do or discourage them from doing things you don't want them to do. All right, so here's an example. You don't want your kids screaming in a store. It's not good for anybody. It annoys you, it annoys everybody else, and it's just bad for your kid to learn that that's okay to do because uh, they'll never have friends, you know, all of that. So you don't want your kids screaming and throwing a fitness store. Is there something I could do to reduce the probability that my kid would scream in the store? You could punish them. That is correct. All right. So because I say if you don't stop, you have uh, no toys the rest of the day, does that 100% mean that the kid's going to stop? No. no. Does it increase the probability that the kid will stop? Yes. It does, right. So will it work every time? No. Will it work every kid? No. But uh, if you apply it cons consistently, um, it, it is much more likely to work than doing nothing, uh, is essentially what that means. Okay. Um, what's something I could do? What's a behavior I would want to see in a kid? Like at a store. At a store, yeah, sure. That works. You want your kids to do nothing? Just exist. <laughs> Don't do bad things. You guys can't think of a single positive thing you want to teach someone to do? Quiet. Okay. Um, Fair enough. All right. There are situations where you would want them to be quiet. Okay. How could I encourage quiet behavior? I could obviously punish it if I don't get it. Kids screaming, making noise, you uh, implement, implement a punishment, reduces the likelihood it's going to happen in the future. What's, uh, so they behave the way I want them to. They're quiet in line or they're quiet at the restaurant or whatever. That's a good thing, okay? Uh, at least to learn that they, they can do that or that, that it, it, it's expected at least to not scream. Okay, how could I encourage that behavior? You can reward them. I can reward them. How could I reward them? Chocolate. A dessert, whatever it might be. It could be whatever, something they like, okay? That's essentially what operant conditioning is. You're gonna use things called reinforcements. That actually sound bad, but. A reinforcer is a good thing. It like bolsters it, makes it more likely to happen. Uh, uh, you can use reinforcements uh, to encourage behavior. Or if I want to discourage behavior, I could use punishments. punishments. Right. Okay, you just gave me some examples of that. But I, I do have to add an extra degree of complexity to this. Reinforcers are uh, good things. These are things that you want. They, they make the behavior more likely uh, by giving somebody something positive or something positive happening to them. 
All right. Examples of reinforcements would be uh, giving them dessert, right? Let them have a dessert. That's what you call a positive reinforcement. All right. That makes sense. It's a reinforcer. It's positive. It, 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 that's what you assume is a good thing. So that that's a that's a term that makes sense. Here's what confuses most people though. I can have negative reinforcements too. Is that a punishment? No, no it's not. Or negative reinforcement. Okay, positive reinforcement uh, is a reward, but so is a negative reinforcement. Most people think that's a punishment. Like, oh, it's negative, it's something bad. That's not what we mean. Here all I mean is positive means I'm giving you something, negative means I'm taking something away. How could I take away something and it's a reward? You're taking away something that they don't like. You take away something they don't like, that is correct. What's an example of something you can take away from a kid to encourage behavior that's, uh, that's good to them, that they like, that they want? You guys can be creative. Think about things kids don't want and don't want to do. Broccoli. Okay. <laughs> the kid doesn't want to eat his broccoli. That doesn't work. My stepdaughter loves broccoli, but um, yeah. Say your kid hates broccoli. All right. What's a what's a way I could use negative reinforcement to encourage behavior? They don't have to be their choice for the day. Okay. Yeah, that's a great example too. Uh, whether it's eating something that they don't want to eat, or if they have chores they don't want to do, I could encourage their behavior by taking away the thing they don't like, whether it's the chore or the broccoli or whatever it is. All right. But these are both good things. I want you guys to know that. Don't get confused, because everyone's going to think, negative reinforcement, oh, punish them. Nope, that's not what we mean. Positive reinforcement is, I give you something you want. Negative reinforcement is, I take away something you don't want. Do I like both of those options? Yes. Yes, right? So I'll give you an example. You tell me if it's positive uh, reinforcement or negative reinforcement. I. You go to the store, you behave well, you're quiet, whatever it is, at the restaurant, so I order you a dessert for your behavior. Positive. Positive what? Reinforcement. Reinforcement, yeah, because we're going to get to the punishment part too, so you got to specify. All right. Um, kids got um, homework they have to do. And I uh, tell them that uh, they don't have to do it today. Negative. <laughs> you can't. Okay, how about this? How about this? You make them practice writing every day. Today you don't have to practice writing. Negative. What is that? Why is that negative reinforcement? You're taking it away. Yeah, you take away something they don't want, right? Yeah, you, you can't. Uh, you can't really take away homework. But if you happen to practice something and they don't necessarily like it, then that'd be an example of that. Um, what about? They behave well at the restaurant, so now they don't have to go to the grocery store with us. Negative reinforcement. Why is it negative reinforcement? They didn't want to run the errand with you. So what did you do? How did you reward them? Not make them go on the errand, right? They just go home and play with their dad or mom or whatever it is. Right, whoever the other spouse is or parent is. Okay, cool. So do we have an understanding for negative and positive reinforcement? It's a reinforcement, it's a reward. So even though this is negative, it's a good thing. It's just take away something you don't want. Okay, uh, punishment. Same idea. I've got positive punishment. Doesn't mean it's like good. And negative punishment. I want you to apply the same logic to these. Examples, not the ones in the notes that you're all looking at. Give me new ones. Um, Somebody give me an example of, oh, by the way, who gave me examples for the each, was it you two that did that? No. I know you gave me one. Who gave me the positive one? You did, the dessert thing. You did. All right. Somebody give me an example of positive punishment. Detention. How is it a positive punishment? Because like, you're teaching them not to do it again. Okay, yeah, that's the punishment part of it. What makes it positive? Your, your example's correct. You just got to tell me why it's correct. You could actually frame it either way, but the way you phrased it is a positive punishment. Why is giving them an attention a positive punishment? 
I'm giving them something they like. I'm taking away something they don't like. What would this be? Now don't look. Your example's right. Why is it a positive punishment? You're giving something they don't want. Yes, there it is. You're giving them something they don't want. Exactly right. So the way you phrased it was, I'm giving them an attention. All right, that's a positive punishment. I'm giving them something they do not want, that they dislike. All right, now somebody give me a negative punishment. Go. Yep, that would be an example of negative punishment. Why is that negative punishment? So taking away their toys, why is that negative punishment? Because it's something that they like and so you take it away. Exactly. So that's taking away something that they like or giving them something they dislike. All right. How could I phrase it so that a detention is actually a negative punishment? The way you phrased it, that is correct, is a positive punishment. So if I give you a lunch detention, that is uh, a positive punishment. How could I use that same punishment and make it, by my phrasing, actually a negative punishment. If you're taking away their lunch time. Taking away their lunch time, right, exactly right. Uh, or at least time with their friends, however you want to phrase it. So depending on how I phrase it, it could be either. But yeah, you saying I'm going to give you attention, you're giving me something I don't want, positive punishment. Uh, I, I'm taking away your lunch time with your friends. It's the same thing, but you, the way you phrase it, I'm taking away something that you actually like. All right, so that's how you have to uh, uh, understand it. So just think always. Reinforcers are always good things. Punishments are always bad things. Uh, and positive means you're giving them something. Negative means they're taking something away. That's all it means. So we understand that distinction between the two. OK, cool. Um, the process of doing this. I mean, can I do this once and it's forever fixed? Like my kid gets mad once at a restaurant and I punish him. Is it like, all right, that's it. The kid's never going to scream again at the, and make noise again at the restaurant. Is that how it works? No. Absolutely not. Uh, what's a, uh, what is a defining feature of if I'm actually trying to affect behavior, right? decrease the probability that it's going to keep happening, how would I uh, do that with a, with a kid, for example? Well, we'll keep using the restaurant example since we're on it. Wouldn't it just be repetition? Of yep. You'd have to consistently apply it. They'd have to know that uh, if they do this thing, something bad's going to happen, all right? And that affects whether they do something or not, all right? Uh, and you're like, wait, that's an association. No, association is I hear the thing and I anticipate the response. This is they know in advance, so they try to avoid it if it's a bad outcome, or if it's a good outcome, they try to uh, acquire and achieve it, all right? So you're, so you're correct and think like, wait, they're still associating. He's like, yeah, they are. But classical conditioning is they respond to something. Operant conditioning is they're able to like plan essentially. Like, oh, I probably shouldn't go on a murderous uh, killing spree because I'm almost certainly going to go to jail for that, right? So we know uh, because we've seen other people, because there are people in prison, uh, you know that if you do those sorts of things that you're likely to be caught uh, and then you will uh, uh, earn yourself some jail time or you will lose yourself some freedom time, uh, depending on how you, uh, how you phrase it, all right? So these are all probabilities. So operant conditioning is it affects what I'm going to do. Uh, and a classical conditioning is like, it, it happens and then I have a response to it. I uh, anticipate the response. So what we would call this process of trying to get people or animals or whatever, or ourselves actually, you can do it with yourself too, to try and do something more consistently or not do something more consistently if it's a bad thing. Um, that's called shaping. Shaping. It's actually a little more complex than that. Let me, let me give you an example from from the most famous operant conditioning proponent, uh, B.F. Skinner. He actually taught um, rats to pull levers for food. He used conditioning to do that. <coughs> so what he would do is he would take these rats, he'd put them in a box or a cage. They call them Skinner's boxes, by the way. If you ever hear that, that's what a Skinner's box is. It's like a, a little... Uh, 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 a cage or maze or whatever, uh, where they condition, offer conditioning, they try to get animals to do things by encouraging certain behaviors and discouraging others. So is it possible for me to just take a rat, put it into a cage, have a button or a lever up here, and they pull it for food, and then they, they, they know that's how they feed themselves? Is that going to happen? No, they would just die. They wouldn't, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't know. How could I get them to know that pulling a lever gets me food. 
Let me ask you this. Is it realistic to sit there and watch a rat for days on end until they randomly happen to pull the lever and then I give them food? No, it's not gonna happen. They're gonna die. How could I, how could I encourage them to uh, do that? When you press it first, just to show them that that's what that uh, That's observational learning. So no, that would not be behaviorism quite, but that exists. Uh, I don't know if rats, how capable they are of that. Humans are, and lots of primates are, and things like that. But and cats even can too. That's how cats, cats can open doors sometimes. They see opening a door enough times, they, they figure out they can just jump up, grab the handle, and go through it. It's pretty crazy. Uh, but that's actually different. That's what we'll talk about mm, tomorrow or, or Thursday. Here's what they do. <clears throat> the odds that a, a rat's gonna walk up and pull a lever are, are just so low, it's not worth even trying. But could I reward the rat for being near the lever? Yeah. You could, right. So let's say you're sitting here, and you gotta be super diligent. You actually have to sit here and watch this thing. Uh, it's in this cage, and if it wanders within a certain proximity, like close, how could I encourage it to go near the, the lever? What could I do? So it's wandering around, it goes in this zone. What do I do? Yep, I could reward it, right? I could give it this food, that'd be a positive reinforcement. Cool. All right, uh, I don't know how much he did this, but could I punish them for not being by the lever? Yes. How could I do that? Not send them food. Uh, not give them food, but they already don't have food. They have to get the food. Electric shock. Yeah, this is where they would use things like shocks, right? <laughs> so if it's, if it's going too far away over here, it actually gets a, gets a shock, right? That would be uh, giving them pain. That's a positive punishment, right? So then they're going to avoid this. I go over here and, oh look, I go over here though, and I actually get a, a food, so that's wonderful. So now they know what about the cage? They don't know the lever yet, but what do they know about the cage? Outside gives me stuff. Yeah, this area gives me food, this area gives me uh, something I want, this area gives me something I don't want, right? So they're gonna hover around here. Are they eventually gonna get really close to or touch the lever in some way, like bump it or just be right near it? Yes. Yep. So once they figure this out and they're always hanging out over here, you wait until they're right next to the lever or they brush up against it or something, then you reward them for that. So now I'm no longer just rewarding them here, I only reward them right next to it or if they bump it or, or whatever. What's the rat learn there? Yeah, if I bump it or I'm right next to it, I get a reward, right? This is the shaping process, by the way. So this is uh, rewarding closer and closer approximations of the desired behavior. What's my desired behavior, by the way? What's my ultimate goal here? The rat to pull the lever, right. So I'm not gonna be able to just wait till the rat pulls the lever. I have to reward them for little closer steps towards it. Eventually, you know, I reward them for touching it, and then I reward them for putting their hand on it, and then I reward them for pulling the lever on it. As long as I consistently do it in those progressive steps, eventually they do learn that they can just walk up and pull the damn lever and get food. So that's how a, a Skinner actually does it. We'll talk more about that. Tomorrow or elaborate on it more tomorrow. All right, so we'll finish up. I do have a list to make sure I don't skip a term because I do that sometimes. A lot of terms for this one. Um, so a little bit more on the terminology uh, for. Uh, so I'll say operants, not just operant though, in classical uh, conditioning terms. So these are things you might see on there. So the first one is the discriminatory stimulus. All right. In operant conditioning, this is where uh, it's the new stimulus that you want them to uh, uh, recognize. All right, so it, it, might, it was previously a neutral stimulus, and now you want that to be the thing they recognize, either for an association or for a uh, uh, trying to encourage a behavior. So if I'm trying to teach my dog to roll over or sit or, or, or bark or, or speak, or, no, you wouldn't say bark, you'd say speak. Um, I want them to hear that stimulus, know that it, it's what I want, and then give me the behavior that I want. So that's what the discrimination has to do. It doesn't mean like you're persecuting them, discrimination. It means that you're learning, they're learning to recognize that one stimulus as the one uh, to respond to. So. Um, if I just go up to an untrained dog and I say, sit, what's it going to do? Nothing. Nothing. They'll all respond differently. So I want them to recognize that the word sit <coughs> means something. Okay? Um, and I can use uh, operant conditioning to do that. Right? You, just, you generally want to use rewards for this. Uh, so discriminatory stimulus is the uh, uh, stimulus that you want them to recognize. You want them 
to recognize. All right, so again, if you're training a dog, that's the command you want them to recognize uh, and um, obey or, 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 or encourage uh, a certain <coughs> behavior. So if I want them to sit, when I say sit, what could I do to train them? What? Right, okay, I'm probably gonna have to, by the way, like show them how to sit. So I'd say sit and like, you know, push down on their back end and get them to sit so they know what it is. Uh, and then you're like, that sounds so forceful. No, it's not actually. But uh, if they resist, I guess it is. But that's kind of how you do it. Um, anyways, so you, you get them to associate that and then yeah, you add the reward to it. And that's opera conditioning. It's like, if you do this, you get a reward. Um, so the rewards, so again, here's a stimulus. That'd be the command, like roll over or uh, sit for dogs, or uh, uh, speak, whatever the command is. Heal, like, you know, say by my heel. You want them to know that sound means I should do this. And you encourage the behavior by rewarding them, uh, uh, oh, like uh, Ashley mentioned. So, let me get you that. Oh my gosh, I'm awkward conditioning you guys. <laughs> You're like, now I don't want to answer. He's manipulating me. All right, so um, I can't just, you said food, a treat, right? Food. Why? Why do you? Why food? Why not just say good boy? Because um, I guess if you're giving them food, they associate the treat with like they're being rewarded, so they want to do it more often. Yeah. So what we're talking about is a primary reinforcer, which is the which is the example of food. That's why you, you start off with the food as the treat, primary reinforcer. These are things that all animals uh, or people or whatever. Uh, well, we're technically animals, but all animals and humans would would want, and that's usually uh, a food or a drink in this case. So things that taste good, things that all people would think taste good. Maybe a dog doesn't like a certain treat, but there is certainly a type of treat that they do like, uh, and that's what you would use. All right, that uses our natural reward systems, dopamine centers, so there's not much effort and thought put into it. So that's a primary reinforcer. I think that makes sense. So that's stuff that, again, every human and, and animal likes, some type of food, and that will serve as a reward for them. All right, that makes sense? You with me on that one? Okay, so again, why doesn't just saying good boy work at first? Why do I have to use food? Because then you have to do it. Because if you said good boy, they're not really getting a reward. And so yeah, they don't know that's a good thing, right? Yeah. But over time, they can learn to associate yeah. that with the food. So even, even, at, even later on, if I don't give him a treat every time he sits, if I say, if I say good boy and give him a treat, He's gonna to learn to associate that. So that actually becomes part of the reward. Like they'll actually get a little hit of dopamine just for you giving them attention, be like, oh, good boy. Like, you know, saying it that way. Uh, then they'll learn to associate that. That can become what's called a secondary or conditioned reinforcer. Because they know that they did a good thing uh, after you've associated, you know, the good boy with the, uh, with the primary reinforcer, the, the treat in this case. Right, so that could be uh, anything uh, that's associated with uh, this primary enforcer, associated with primary. It could be whatever you want, like good boy. Um, it could be any compliment or anything like that. Also, for humans, you can be more intricate. You can be more uh, complex. I don't have to give you food as a reward. What could I give you instead as a reward? Yeah, why? What well, more food? But uh, I don't have to. Uh, why, why would money work for humans? It doesn't work for dogs, but why would it work for humans? Everyone wants money. Why? What do you use that money for? Things. Yes, you either use it for necessities or you use it in case you like, you know, have all your necessities. Uh, then you would just use it for uh, usually some form of pleasure, like seeing a movie you like or getting uh, an item of clothing you like, you're getting a, a phone you like, whatever it might be. Right, so you're gonna use that to reward yourself. So if I, I might not know exactly what you want, right? but if I just give you money, a token basically, to buy what you want, then that serves as just as good of a reward. So uh, it could be a good boy, uh, or it could be any sort of token uh, economy. And all I mean by token economy is like, just think of like Funworks when you were a kid. Like, you can exchange those tokens for things you like. Uh, every kid's gonna pick something different, although almost all of them pick the candy because they're so cheap. But uh, you, can, you can pick whatever you want, essentially. Uh, as your own reward. So token economy, and again, the most common one is, is of course money. So if I reward you with money for something, maybe you do want food, you can go buy that food. Maybe you don't want food right there though because you're already full, you can go buy something else that, that functions as a reward, uh, which encourages the behavior. 
So that's just the difference between the two. This is universal. All you know, animals are going to respond to food and water as they reinforce, that's a need of ours. But when you get a little more advanced, like with humans, and we can understand uh, that we can exchange different things for things we want, uh, the secondaries uh, can work in the token economy, or you know, just associating the, the dog, associating the, the food with the good boy and positive attention, that's also a reward. Uh, too. You can see that with kids too. You just say they do a good job and like they'll light up. Like they just want that attention. Um, so that attention and that positive uh, interaction, whether it's an animal or a human, that can also serve as a secondary reinforcer. All right. Just understand this though. Both of these are rewards. And uh, I think I've told you this before. But when I feel good and happy, uh, there's a reward. What am I actually experiencing in my brain? What's going on? Yeah, you're getting hit with it. You're getting hits of dopamine, uh, maybe serotonin too, but yeah. Yeah, that's your reward center. It's, it's dopaminergic. So that's why uh, um, things are so addictive. Uh, good food is addictive. That's why people overeat on things that are unhealthy. That's why they get addicted to drugs. Uh, that's why they get addicted to, to watching Netflix over and over, why you guys get addicted to, well, all of us. I was at one point too. Addicted to social media. Because all those likes and comments and things like that, uh, it's not just like, oh, that's wonderful. It's like your brain's going like, oh, it's just using like little dopamine hits every time you get that. All right. And if you don't get them, then you're like, oh, oh, and then you end up want, wanting to get more. You, you get more obsessed with it. And anyways, so uh, we'll get into that more when we talk about, I know we talk about that more. Where do we talk about addiction and development? It might be in unit six. It might be in unit eight, but we'll, we'll talk more about that later. All right, um, so any questions about reinforcers? So just know the difference, primary, food and drink, universal, secondary, uh, it, it can function as something else, positive attention, uh, or it could be a, a token that you could exchange for whatever you want. Okay, we already got what acquisition is itself. Acquisition is when you successfully train uh, a, a, a person or a, a dog to uh, associate something together, or in the case of opera conditioning, when you, you encourage, successfully encourage a certain behavior or you successfully discourage another one, all right? So acquisition would be your kids starting to get uh, fussy in the restaurant and you say, hey, stop or you don't get your toys and you get home or you get a timeout or whatever and then they successfully stop the behavior because they know, oh, okay, well, I'm gonna be punished so I better not do this, all right? Or you uh, try to motivate your kid to get better grades or whatever or do their homework uh, uh, and you say, oh, you can have more, I don't know, time on uh, Mario Kart time. That's what my stepson's currently hooked on, <coughs> which is convenient because I am also hooked on it. So we both play it together. Uh, but um, yeah, so that'd be an example. Oh, if you do this, then you'll, you'll, well, you have more Mario Kart time. And then they uh, accomplish the goal, success, and then they get the, the Mario Kart. That's the, the acquisition. All right, uh, that's just successful pairing associate or encouraging behavior. Okay. What about though, in the case of a dog, for example, um, if I uh, have trained him, I got an acquisition. He, he sits when I say sit, even if I don't have a, a treat, like I say good boy, whatever. What if they'll all of a sudden, he just stops? Like, uh, and this can happen where you say sit and they just don't sit. They don't know or they don't want to or, or, or whatever. What would that be called? Extinction, Extinction right? It's disappeared completely. That can happen. Uh, the association disappeared. It could be that they forgot. It could be that you didn't reward them enough, so they don't think that they're going to be rewarded for it, uh, which is why we'll talk about uh, rewarding reward schedules uh, after we're done with all this terminology. Because uh, you, you kind of have to maintain some sort of reward. If you just reward them a bunch at the beginning and then you never reward them again, they'll, they'll stop doing it. And that's called extinction. All right? But if uh, the next day, even though he didn't listen to you the entire day before, if the next day uh, you say it and he listens randomly, or if you reward him again and he starts listening again, that could be uh, referred to as spontaneous recovery or just recovery. So spontaneous more so means it's like random. He just randomly starts listening to it again, even though you didn't reward him. But if you start implementing the uh, reward system again and they start doing it again, that's just recovery. So uh, um, behavior returns. Again, spontaneous means you probably didn't do anything. It just happens for no reason. They remember or, or whatever. They're in a better mood. I don't know. Uh, and recovery would just be if you started uh, rewarding them again and, and it comes back. Any questions about that? Okay. Oh, is there discrimination and generalization next? I think. Mm -hmm. Or at least it's on the list. I already lost my damn list of terms. Yeah? yeah? Okay. So, um, 
this can happen, and these are uh, successes and errors here. Uh, generalization. Okay. Let's say I teach my dog how uh, to uh, listen to the command sit. All right. If I'm watching TV and my dog's there, um, would is it possible that somebody on TV says the word sit or hit or pit or whatever the word might be? Um, it could sound just like sit or it could be somebody else saying it. Is it possible that the dog could hear the word hit or uh, the TV say the word sit uh, and think that you just gave the command and then uh, sit down? Is it possible? Yes. Yeah, it can happen. If they screw up and accidentally associate something that's close to it, like a different word that sounds similar or it's coming from the TV and not you, that'd be generalization. That'd be accidentally, accidental association. Right? They hear a similar thing and they think, oh, that's the uh, sit command. So then they decide to sit, and, but you didn't tell them to sit um, or uh, it came from the TV or, or whatever it might be. All right. But what if someone is talking and they say, they're not talking to the dog, they say sit or they say hit or hit or whatever the word might be that sounds like it and the dog doesn't hear it, or sorry, they do hear it, but they don't respond to it. They know, okay, that's not the same thing. That's not my uh, 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 owner telling me sit and then, I, and then I sit. This is somebody else not talking to me or it's uh, a different word that just sounds like it. What would that be? That'd be the discrimination. So successfully um, recognizing the stimulus among similar stimuli or situations. So again, that's when somebody's not talking to the dog and they mention the word sit or they hear a word that is similar like pit or hit or whatever it might be uh, and that uh, is where they know they recognize nope that's not the same thing and they don't respond to it this is when they accidentally respond to it even though it's not the same thing so do we understand the difference between generalization and discrimination okay if you want if it helps remember it uh, that's almost the same thing as distinguishing discriminating is distinguishing like you recognize oh no that's a specific thing <clears throat> all right uh, what are the terms of there's practice, high order learning, and um, there's I know there's more superstitious behavior. Yeah. Yeah, high order. Learning. High order. Yeah. I know there's another one I'm forgetting. We did shaping. Mm -hmm. We got that already, I think. What? Practice. Practice. I'm gonna do superstitious behavior because I, if I didn't add the notes, I think I forgot to. Yeah. So, and then you can just add that one yourself. <laughs> Here are some. Uh, Additional developments. So uh, humans are really good at this. Humans are really good at figuring out that you can actually link multiple events together. Uh, and you can actually get animals to recognize this too. So high order learning just means there's a sequence of stimuli, not just like one, like here's the light, now I do my thing. It'd be like there's a sequence of things and you recognize based on that sequence what you should do. Um, so here's an example, um, and we'll use animals still because it's, it's hard to come up with, at least on top of my head, human examples of complex uh, behavior patterns. But here we go. Let's say you successfully uh, train your dog to uh, salivate when he, when he hears a bell. All right? So every time you ring the bell, the dog's like, here comes food, and they start salivating. Bless you, thank you. Could, yes, bless you. Could you um, add something before the bell? that gets them to recognize, oh, if this happens, then the bell happens, then I get food. Is that a possibility? Mm -hmm. It is. For animals, it, you're much more limited on how many things you can stack on, but uh, it is possible. So, for example, if every day before I rang the bell, before I fed him, I would go and turn the light, flicker the light on and off, assuming the dog's in the room, obviously. I flicker the dog, uh, the, flicker the dog. <laughs> <laughs> I flicker the light on and off, then I ring a bell, then I feed him. Do you think he's going to eventually start salivating when I flick the uh, lights on and off? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Why is that? He's yep. He's associated with the uh, bell and also the uh, the uh, the food too. So uh, that's just uh, additional stimuli. For humans, <clears throat> we we are we can understand it much more complexly. Complexly. So we understand what are called contingencies. So like. Uh, um, we know that there are nuances and differences in situations. So here's what I mean. Um, 
depending on the situation, if I say, wow, you're smart, does that mean necessarily, yeah, you're smart? Do I actually think you're smart maybe? Could I mean something else when I say that? I could be sarcastic, right. So in this case, the stimuli is the same, but you realize that it's conditional on my tone. So you're like stacking on different variations of meaning. And you can go endlessly complex with that. Uh, uh, and that's where humans kind of break away from animals. Uh, but uh, most animals still can like, you can at least stack on different orders uh, of, of stimuli. So I can add the um, uh, lights plus the bell plus, not plus the name. Uh, plus the uh, uh, food, and then pretty soon uh, they, you know, they've already salivated because of the bell, and then pretty soon they start salivating because of the lights, because they know this happens and this happens and this happens, and they can they can deduce and figure out that it, that it's coming next. All right, and again with humans, that's it can get endlessly complex as to how we can figure out how things work and how they're contingent and based on other things, other factors. Okay, any questions about high order learning? I probably made it too complex with the human example, but. Just keep it simple with the animal. You're just adding another stimuli that they respond to, uh, to the same uh, order uh, behavior. Okay, um, practice is next. Practice is actually an excellent way to uh, condition yourself. <clears throat> this is where, well, let's say for example, most people are like, uh, uh, boy, I, I think I used the, the, the example of baseball, right? So most people, they imagine themselves, I mean, I don't like baseball, but whatever, I know that people do, or softball. Let's pretend I do like baseball, I'm a kid. I probably imagine myself one day playing in the major leagues, and I might have a favorite player, whoever it might be. I don't even know any baseball players anymore. I know all the old baseball players are retired. Uh, didn't Alex Rodriguez retire? No one knows, because no one else watches baseball. Um, so, uh, let's pretend he's still in the major leagues. I don't think he is, but I might be wrong, I don't know. Um, let's pretend he is in the major league still. Maybe I'll, one day I'll be like, I'm gonna be just like Alex Rodriguez. Um, is that realistic? Am I, am I gonna go outside and, and all of a sudden start hitting the, you know, cracking hits like A-Rod and, and, and fielding like him? No way, right, it's not gonna happen. So if my expectation is reward equals major league baseball millions of dollars, then uh, I, I'm never going to experience that. So how could I encourage my behavior to uh, continue developing my skill and getting better at baseball? How could I trick myself, kind of? Practice, Practice okay. How? So I immediately go out and set the uh, pitching machine to 100 miles an hour and start trying to hit those? No, no that would be a terrible idea. It's like gradual, like gradually going with something. So first you'd start by something like really liking and then you hit it and then you try to like make it um, increase in difficulty. Yeah, you would, you would do it progressively. Because again, I, I told you guys this before, whether you're working out muscles or you're um, um, trying to learn something, a new skill with neurons, it takes a bunch of time. In the case of lifting uh, weights, uh, your muscle breaks down, then it builds up a tiny little bit each day more to make it able to take a little more stress. Your neurons, the more they're being used, uh, your body adds on myelin uh, layers to make the, uh, the current uh, quicker and more efficient. So it takes a long time to get better at anything, whether it's a physical strength thing, or it's a skill thing, or it's a learning thing. So if, I, I, if I'm expecting to go out and just start killing it right off the bat, by practicing, I'm gonna be very disappointed. Uh, it's much better to sort of kind of trick yourself uh, with operant conditioning, which I don't have up here. Oh, operant conditioning. So what's the reward if I'm practicing? Let's say, uh, just like you mentioned, I could start with like a slow pitch softball uh, to start batting. How does that, or even a t-ball. How, how does that, uh, how, how am I rewarding myself by learning to do that? Where's the reward? If you're playing on a team, I mean, Oh, I said T-ball. Did I say team? I meant like a T-ball. Let's just, let's forget the T-ball thing. Let's stick with the, the large softball. So I'm not going to start with a baseball at 100, 100 mile an hour fast pitches. I'm going to start slow pitch softball. Why? Yes. So the award would be successfully uh, uh, learning how to hit that consistently. Right, uh, I'm much more likely to consistently start hitting a slow pitch softball than a 100 mile an hour pitch baseball. Right, so you kind of like trick yourself, and that's the reward. When you successfully do it and you get good at it, like that initiates your dopamine uh, uh, and serotonin reward centers, uh, and you experience a reward. So then you're encouraged to go to the next step. It's like you've already mastered that. The next would be 
Now it's a fast pitch soft or medium pitch softball, right? And then they pitch it a little faster. And once you hit that consistently, ha, I did it, success. Uh, and you go through that progression, then you go to fast pitch softball, then you go to like medium pitch baseball, then fast pitch baseball, and pretty, pretty soon, now you're on a high school team or a college team doing well, uh, and that's how you practice. So you kind of like trick yourself to do slightly harder versions that are possible uh, progressively. If I just expect myself to go out and start, you know, crushing major league pitches off the bat, I'm never, I'm never going to experience that because I'll never get better. I'll never reward myself, I'll get discouraged, and I'll stop. All right, this prevents you from getting discouraged. That allows you to actually see your own progress, uh, which rewards you. And does that encourage my behavior or discourage it? It encourages it, right? So that's why I think anyway, they lump this in with operant conditioning. So practice is a uh, uh, slower, optimal, difficult to progressively reward, encourage, improvement. Because again, if, oh, hell, I'll use the Mario Kart example. Uh, in Mario Kart, I'm going to use Mario Kart as an example. Uh, in Mario Kart, if you're just starting, uh, they have different speeds, all right? The lowest one is 50 cc, it's like this basically. Uh, it goes 50 cc, 100 cc, 150 cc, something else, what's it called, like mixed or something? Something else, it's called mixed I think. No, that's not what it's called, but something else. And there's 200 cc, all right? You start at 50 cc because the car is much slower. Like you, you learn how to handle it and how the track works and, and how to, how to uh, you learn the maps, first of all, and then you learn how to control the car and all of that. If I started at 200 cc, uh, what it would be, if you just started out and you know how to play it, your car would just be all over the place. You'd just be like, <laughs> flying off the track all, over, all the time, and it'd be really frustrating, and you wouldn't enjoy it. You'd just lose every damn race. So there'd be no uh, enjoyment, there's no reward, so I'd probably give up. But the reason why they give this option and why you generally want to start somewhere in here is you'll actually be able to learn it quicker and do well quicker. So you see yourself improving, you see yourself doing better against the little computer racers or whatever they are, uh, and you slowly move up until you get better control of the vehicle. Oh, I've won all of my races consistently here. Uh, then you go over 200 cc until you slowly get better and see yourself placing better uh, and match that all the way up uh, until you eventually get to the, uh, the hardest part here. That's the, the practice. You have to see progress, otherwise you'll get discouraged and you won't actually want to do it. Practice. Uh, in optimally difficult intervals. Optimally, optimally meaning it's difficult, but you can still do it. Uh, that's what keeps you rewarded and keeps you going. Does that make sense? You with me on that? Okay, yeah. That's why you don't practice with fast pitches right off the bat. You, you work your way up. Um, and that's the best way to do it, too. You'll progress quicker and you'll be more consistent because you actually want to do it. It actually encourages the behavior. All right. Um, so now we just have superstitious behavior and reward. Schedules, yeah. All right, this one you have to add. How could operant conditioning, or classical conditioning for that matter, but how could operant conditioning actually cause me to be superstitious about something? So here's an example. Um, what's a common superstition? Oh, black cat crosses your path and you're gonna have bad luck for whatever amount of time like seven years, we'll just say seven years. Where do you think they came up with that? Or don't look into a broken mirror or you'll have bad luck for seven years. Or don't walk under a ladder or you'll have bad luck for 10 years or whatever it is. Where do you think they came up with these? People actually believe these, by the way. Someone could have seen a black hat across them and they had bad luck afterwards, so they associated it. Exactly, it's a false association. So likely what happened at some point is Somebody saw a black cat cross their path, something bad happened, they're like, oh my gosh, the reason why the bad thing happened is the stupid black cat walked across my path. Don't do it, guys. And then all of a sudden it becomes this superstitious belief. Or the mirror thing, you look to a mirror, broken mirror, something bad happened, it was like, it's because I looked in that damn broken mirror. I knew it, because it happened like right afterwards. Or, uh, you know, it's because they walked under a ladder or whatever. By the way, I've done all of these things and nothing ever happened because it's a false association. Um, baseball. Sometimes these uh, pitchers or batters have um, like these little routines they do. Like uh, they'll go up and they'll like, they'll have their bat and they'll like hit their feet three times and like, you know, do like whatever they do with their, their arms and do two practice swings and then they go up and hit. Why do you think they do all those things? 
Yeah, they've uh, probably, almost certainly anyway, uh, they have um, developed a false association. So like their little routine before they go up to bat, like a couple times they hit a home run or got a good hit, so they think, oh yeah, that I have to do this little stupid thing uh, before I go up to bat. Or uh, people have these like traditions where like, oh, well, uh, uh, we all go to, uh, we all do this, eat this certain food before the football game's on, and then that's gonna uh, help us win somehow because, of course, uh, a couple times they ate this certain food and then their favorite team won. They're like, oh, that's what does it, which is just absurd because the food that you eat at your house has no impact on what a football team does off somewhere else in another state. Uh, but people actually believe this crap, and why do they believe it? Yeah, they falsely associated it. So, um, did the things that they believe in superstitiously, did they impact the result at all? No. Not really, it was just random, right? So because the guy went up and hit his feet three times his bat and hit a home run, it was just totally random, all right? And then he's like, oh, that's why I did it, so now he starts doing it. Or, oh, we had burritos three nights in a row before the Raiders game and they won, so therefore we're having three burritos three nights in a row before every Raiders game. They just make these ridiculous associations. Um, one thing I do have to add, this is just gonna say this false association. So it's two things that are actually unrelated, but you have linked them in your mind incorrectly. Um, there is something to um, like these little pre-throw or pre-batting uh, uh, traditions that people have. It doesn't mean that that's the reason why they hit the home run, but some people have like a routine to get them focused. That can work. Uh, whereas if they don't do it, they're like distracted, like, oh, I didn't do my thing yet, and then, then they're gonna be anxious and, and they're gonna miss. So that's true, um, but that's really just a matter of you having a routine and focusing. That's not what actually made you hit the home run, right? You could have randomly, like, your routine could be shrugging your shoulders, but it doesn't make you hit the home run or not, it's just that's what your routine is. So the routine is arbitrary, uh, but um, you do need it to focus sometimes. And I know that, for example, for me, because like when I used to play uh, basketball in high school, I'd do free throws, and I always bounced the ball three times. I knew it wasn't because if I didn't do that, I would miss, like it was luck, but like that's just like my body's routine to like focus uh, and, 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 and so I can uh, shoot properly. If I walked up and did it randomly, uh, I wouldn't be like calibrated, focused, and centered uh, to shoot it. So I knew that like bouncing the ball three times doesn't magically make the ball go in because sometimes I'd miss, but uh, it did like focus me as part of my routine so I had a better chance of it. All right, but superstitious behaviors like the cat thing and the eating burritos three times before the, the game and all that crap, that's just a false association which leads to superstitious behaviors. Make sense? All right, cool. Uh, last thing is, uh, with all of these, you do have to monitor how you are rewarding and reinforcing things uh, to make sure it keeps going. So, the example I gave you, if I just gave my dog a treat a bunch, every time they said sit, or I said sit, and then I never did it again, I didn't say good boy or anything, is he gonna keep sitting forever? Probably not, maybe, but probably not. So there are some schedules you can use uh, to, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Encourage, make sure that behavior continues. The first one is actually the worst one. Uh, you usually wanna use this initially, so they start linking the two things together, like, oh, um, I pull the lever, I get food. Or, oh, uh, you know, uh, I, I hear, the, the bell and, and food comes next. So you have to do that initially, so they make the connection. But continuous reinforcement, I should say reinforcement schedules, so that makes it more clear. Um, this is when you do it every single time. So it's uh, reward for every uh, response. Or behavior. So again, every time, initially anyway, when I tell my dog to sit, I want to reward them so they make that association and it encourages the behavior. But this one is the least reliable because if I always reward them and I stop rewarding them, uh, then they, they think it's no longer uh, associated and they'll, they'll stop doing it. So this one is the most vulnerable to extinction. Let's say vulnerable to extinction. You've got to keep doing it at least a little bit, a little bit. So these next three are basically ways you can do it. Not every time, but enough to keep them interested and in, in still doing the behavior uh, down the road. 
so that's continuous. There's also a fixed ratio. This is how Starbucks did all of you guys in Java Juice and all those. Uh, this is um, a reward on a fixed uh, number of responses or behaviors. Uh, so this is like a uh, those little cards you get for like uh, a sandwich place or, or Starbucks or whatever, where like buy 10 drinks, like every 10th drink, your next drink is free. Um, so you're like, do I know exactly when I'm gonna get my reward? I do. I, I mean, I know what day, but I know after my ninth purchase that the next one's gonna be free, right? I get my reward after the next one, right? I, I know exactly when it's gonna be, correct? Yes. And when I start over and I've got my free drink and it goes back down to zero and I gotta buy nine more to get the 10th one free, uh, do I know how many drinks it's gonna take till I get rewarded again? It does. Do you think it also encourages me to keep going there? It does, because people are like, I want Starbucks, and it costs money, but like, oh, but I'm close to getting my free one, and then, so then they'll go, they'll go do it, right? So that's like a, a, a one out of 10, one every 10 is free, or however the deal is gonna go. You know exactly what the reward is and when it's gonna come, but you have to keep doing it to get the reward. Because if I never go to Starbucks, then I'm never gonna get that 10th drink, I'm never gonna get the free one, all right? So I have to keep going there, but I do know it's coming exactly when. So I think those are the two easiest to understand. Do we understand those two? Every time, the exact same pattern is fixed ratio. All right, this is where I lose some people. Um, this is a, called partial or intermittent. I want to call it intermittent because that implies it's, it's based on time. <clears throat> intermittent. Reinforcement. And there's variable ratio. Okay, intermittent reinforcement, by the way, these two are actually the strongest uh, reinforcers. Um, this one I think is actually the strongest. I don't know if that's 100% certain, but these two are very strong ways to keep the behavior going. Intermittent reinforcement is varying amounts of time between rewards, not, not, not responses. Time. So here's an example. Um, let's say I get a bonus. I'm a store manager, and I get a bonus every time they review my store and it does well. Like we have good sales, or or or, or whatever it might be. You with me on that? Okay. But do I know when my regional boss is going to come by and check my store for my to give me my reward? No, I don't. I, it could be a week. It could be six months. It could be Eight months, I don't know. But I do know when they show up, I get the reward. That The only question is, when are they going to show up? Are you with me on that? Okay, so it's like a guarantee. So I always know there's gonna be a reward, but I just don't know when that reward's going to happen, as far as time goes, right? Uh, so in this case, it could be a, a manager um, awaiting inspection. It's always gonna be different. It could be uh, 10 days between inspections, or two months, or seven months, doesn't, you don't know, right? So if they come every, uh, if they come uh, 10 days later and they, my store is good, yay, I get my bonus. Uh, if they come two months after that and the store's not good, oh, I don't get my bonus, or maybe I get punished in some way. Um, and then they don't come again for another five months or seven months. I don't know when they're coming, but I do know that they're going to show up. All right, and the, the, uh, the variance is time, not responses. Right, because it's one response every time. I just don't know when it's coming. So how would this be different than gambling? Does gambling have anything to do with time? No. What is gambling dependent on? Chance. Luck. Yeah, you're right. But like, if I go to a casino and I stand there, am I eventually going to win? No. What do I have to do? You got to play. So it's based on the responses. All right, this one I can't control the responses. They just show up whenever, I don't know when. Can I control the responses at a slot machine as long as I have money? Can I? I can, right? Assuming I have the money for it, I can keep pulling the lever on the slot machine or keep buying in on, on the whatever card game it is, all right? So this one's not a time issue, and it is random, right? These are both random. Random. Random time intervals. This is random, random time. This is random. Uh, response. 
So uh, on this one, it's just uh, uh, varying reward by chance uh, per response. So I could hypothetically go into a casino, pull the lever two times, and get a mega reward. Right? Is that possible? It is. Could I also go in there and pull the lever 2,000 times and never get a reward? Yes. I could, right? So it's just based on my responses. It doesn't have to do with the time intervals. I could go in once per day and pull the lever. It will make no difference on uh, the frequency that it happens. All right, it's based on a percentage that they put in their machines, just enough to make you feel like you win and remember it, but not enough for you to actually make money in the long run. Um, but uh, it's spent on how many times I pull the lever, not how much time goes between the lever pulls. Like uh, five, five lever pulls across five hours is the exact same chance as five lever pulls in 25 seconds. It's depending on how many times I pull a lever. So does that sort of help break the two apart in your mind and separate them in any way? Okay, yeah, this is again time-based. It's one response every time, I just don't know when the response is coming. This is uh, depending on how many times uh, uh, I respond. Got that? All right, that's the one that'll confuse people. Um, so partial intermittence time-based, variable ratio is response-based. Uh, and then fixed, of course, is you know exactly when you're going to get it. And continuous, you also know because it's every single time. All right. Um, why do you think this one, maybe this one, but I'm pretty sure it's this one. Why is this one the most effective? Is it because that's where the word afterwards? So, like, you're the variable, right? Because it's on response, right? So could be possible that's a reward, so you are inclined to do it. Yeah, this one, um, I can affect maybe how often I get it, absolutely. But I also don't know. These ones I know. It's going to happen every time, right? This one, I know exactly when it's coming, like, uh, you know, the 10th the time or the 5th time or whatever. This one, I also don't, I don't know when it's going to come, but I know whenever they show up, I'm going to get my reward or not. But I can't impact it. This one, I don't know when it's going to come, and can I impact how frequently I do the activity? Mm -hmm. I can, right. So this one again, uh, every time, and I probably don't want the reward every time, because like if my reward is a brownie, I'm not just gonna do it eight times in a row, because like the six, seven, eight brownie aren't gonna be very delicious, right? Uh, fixed ratio, it, it takes me a while, but I'm not gonna like wanna do something 10 times all day to get one thing at the end. This one, I don't know when I show up. This one I can though. I don't know when it's coming. It could be the next lever pull, and I can keep pulling the lever as long as I got money. So that's why this one is so addictive, because you, feel like anyway, you can impact it the most. Because uh, you don't know when it's coming, but if I do it more often, then it's more likely to happen. All right, make sense? All right, cool. That is that. Take your break.